This is Jackie Faka, CoBank's new biofuel economist, and I'm joined with my colleague, Terry, who serves as our energy economist. And we are just coming back from a great event at the National Ethanol Conference and really came away with this greater sense of urgency for collaboration and attaining this goal of net zero emissions in our U.S. transportation sector. And the really exciting thing, too, for agriculture is there is a lot of optimism on the role that they can play in this this fight to to reduce global emissions. That's right, Jackie. And in fact, one of the key messages from the conference was really this idea of radical collaboration, and it's really what we need to get to net zero. So collaboration among competitors, supply chain partners is going to be really important. And for downstream transportation, and especially that heavy carbon area or hard to carbonize area of long haul trucking, aviation and shipping, there's going to be a need to sort of share notes to be able to collaborate at that sector to get us where we need to go. Let's turn to Jeff Cooper, who is the president and CEO of the Renewable Fuels Association, longtime friend, to see how those partnerships are creating new momentum. Jeff, thanks so much for joining Terry and I for this Energy and Transitions video podcast. Share with us how these partnerships, sometimes even unlikely ones, are creating new momentum for you and the ethanol industry. The ethanol industry for decades has had some remarkable accomplishments and, and policy victories, uh, whether you're talking about the renewable fuel standard or progress on E15 or building new export markets, or most recently securing some very important tax incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act, we've achieved a lot. But we also know that none of those achievements would have happened if we had to do this by ourselves. We've always had lots of different partners and allies and collaborators that have helped us secure these wins for the industry. You're right, sometimes these partnerships are unexpected, maybe a bit surprising, uh, non-traditional you might say, but you know, you look at folks like working with the oil industry or working with environmental groups, and most recently working with the airlines. Five to 10 years ago, we would not have probably ever imagined that we would be working side by side with some of the major airlines on sustainable aviation fuels and the need to decarbonize the aviation sector. Jeff, as the economist at the bank, I primarily work with rural electric cooperatives, and I was really surprised. It's the first time attending your conference, and thank you for that. But I was really surprised to see one of the panels was entitled Ethanol and Electricity, the Best of Both Worlds. And in fact, uh, your organization has their own plug-in hybrid vehicle. And that was actually on display at the conference. That was really cool to see. Can you walk me through how low carbon ethanol and electric drivetrain technology can work together to achieve decarbonization and deep decarbonization within transportation? Yeah, absolutely. This is a project we're, we're very excited about because again, we think it demonstrates that partnerships can lead to sometimes surprising results. Uh, when we look at decarbonizing the light duty transportation uh, fuel marketplace, I think too often that discussion is framed as EVs versus biofuels or EVs versus petroleum. We don't see it that way. We think there are a multitude of solutions and, and it's going to take a portfolio approach. And we think there are you know, characteristics that each of these different energy sources bring that can be combined. And we think there are complementary strategies. And really the purpose of our plug-in hybrid electric vehicle is to showcase some of those uh, synergies uh, between these and, and amongst these various technologies. So we've got a plug-in hybrid flex fuel vehicle that is a Ford Escape. It runs on E85, but it also has an electric motor and, and external charging. And we think that combination has really provided uh, tremendous emissions benefits We've been recording those very carefully. It also has provided some, some economic benefits, uh, lower cost of operation. You know, some of these solutions can provide the sorts of carbon performance that we know consumers are looking for at a lower cost and without sacrificing convenience or flexibility. So it's been a very exciting project for us, and we we're happy to, to showcase that at the conference. You know, I think there's a lot of concern maybe at ethanol levels about this increase in electric vehicles that are out there and the decrease that it could mean for ethanol. But where are we at right now with an ethanol outlook that does include this increase in electric vehicles coming onto the road? We know that every one million new electric vehicles that are introduced to the fleet, that is going to reduce gasoline consumption by about 450 million gallons. 
And that means ethanol consumption, if we're talking about 10% blends, is going to be reduced by about 45 million gallons. Uh, so yeah, that, that is something to consider. But what else we should be considering is that there's another 60 billion gallons of diesel and distillate fuel that's being used in this country, and another 25 billion gallons of aviation fuel that's being used every year. There's zero ethanol being blended or going into those applications today, and we see a tremendous opportunity for ethanol to play a role in decarbonizing the heavy duty and aviation sectors moving forward to the point where we're offsetting any loss that we might see in the light duty fuel pool. That's exciting. And really getting a realistic game plan, a blueprint on how we arrive at net zero, which includes includes all of our smart thinkers to the table. Well, and you're, you set us up so wonderfully for our uh, four-part series that we are going to turn to some other folks here that can help give us that full cycle tour of decarbonization and what we can expect. So Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. We're joined by Christine Clark, who was a featured speaker at the NEC conference earlier this year on collaborating for carbon reduction. Let's start off by hearing about CF Industries' green fertilizer initiative that's produced using hydrogen from carbon-free resources and how CF Industries is partnering with others within the supply chain. Yeah, hi, Terry. Good morning, everyone. Um, CF Industries is the world's leading producer of ammonia, and ammonia is largely used either directly as a fertilizer or upgraded into higher-value fertilizers. And ammonia production is a very emissions intensive process. And so CF is working to decarbonize its asset base through reduction of emissions associated with that ammonia production. Um, There's a couple ways we can do that. Uh, The first, as Terry mentioned, is through green hydrogen production, which is produced from renewable energy and water. And then that hydrogen is further upgraded into ammonia. The other opportunity we have to reduce our emissions is through carbon capture and storage of the CO2 that's generated in the ammonia production process. So CF has both of these projects in flight at our Louisiana, Donaldsonville, Louisiana facility, which is the largest ammonia production complex in the world. And we'll have a low carbon fertilizer coming to the market Um, this year in smaller volumes, and then next year as we bring our large CCS project online. Christine, with 50% of the world's food production depending on fertilizer application, ammonia literally helps put food on the table. So share with us, how can green ammonia empower producers to lower their carbon footprint without sacrificing yield productivity or changing their fertilizer application preferences? Yeah, that's a great point. So the carbon intensity of corn, um, a substantial part of that is due to the production of nitrogen fertilizers, ammonia and its upgraded products. About 25% of the overall carbon footprint of corn is due to that upstream nitrogen fertilizer manufacturing. And so what we can do is substantially reduce the, the carbon intensity of that piece of the value chain and deliver to um, the retailer and the farmer the same product that they may have been using before, for example, ammonia or UAN, um, with a lower carbon footprint. And that allows them to continue the same farming practices they are using today um, while making a a meaningful reduction in, in the overall footprint of their product. That's wonderful. Christine, we're really excited about the projects that you are working on. Really excited about hearing about the expansion from your Donaldsonville project. Want to thank you for joining us. Enjoyed your conversation on the panel there at NEC. So thank you so much. Okay. We know that agriculture is currently playing a prominent role in the U.S. efforts to to really respond to climate change. But how do we measure that effort? Our next guest, Mitch Hoare, the founder of Continuing Ag, has some answers for us. Well, Mitch, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, You're there in your pickup truck pulled over so we can follow up. You've had a busy month traveling, you just shared, and we were able to hear some of your great insight when we were at the National Ethanol Conference. And so much opportunity uh, in this space, especially for farmers. And as a farmer yourself, you know, as we look to 
to reduce the carbon intensity score by 50%, there's this new revenue potential for ethanol plants, especially um, that they can pass it on to farmers. So share with us how farmers can reduce their CI score, their profit potential and Continuum Ag's 1 billion bushel challenge to get more farmers to really understand what a CI score even is. Yeah, I well, appreciate you having me. So that opportunity you're alluding to is 45Z. We're still waiting for some rules, but today, farmers, we need to know what our CI scores are so that we can help our friends uh, in the biofuel space to lower their CI. Today, the corn is more than 50% of the quote-unquote problem, but with uh, better soil health management systems, we can actually be carbon negative um, and really be part of the solution. So Continuum Ag launched the Billion Bushel Challenge in December because there is 6 billion bushels of corn that goes into ethanol every year, and we want to score the first billion bushels. As we sit today uh, in March, we are at 154 million bushels that we have scored so far. So plenty of room uh, before we hit a billion, but wow, we are really making strides, 154 million bushels. And the average carbon intensity score of those bushels is 10.6. The default number is 29 or thereabouts. It's county by county based, but our average farmer, 10.6, that's basically a 20 point CI reduction that these biofuel companies could tap into by collaborating with their farmers. Oh, that's a great story. And Mitch, I guess I want to understand, you know, we we have to understand what's in it for the farmer, right? So the opportunities, and I want to explore that, what opportunities exist for grain co-ops, farmer input suppliers? We need to bring them along on this journey, but the question is, you know, how do we get them on board and be part of the solution of lowering the carbon intensity of the crops? Yeah. So the money flows through the biofuel producer, okay? Ethanol, sustainable aviation fuel, biodiesel, or renewable diesel. Let's think about ethanol to simplify. Okay, so the money goes through the ethanol producer. They can buy low-carbon corn direct from farmer or, like most of it does today, from the elevator. And the elevator needs to be buying the low-carbon corn from their farmer. At either level, on farm or at the elevator, the bushels are scored based on a weighted average of the fields that they come from. So ultimately, what Continuum is doing is helping farmers get their CI score per field, and then running a weighted average as we aggregate bushels, whether it be at our on-farm grain sites or at the elevator, those bushels get aggregated and blended, and the CI scores are blended on a weighted average as well. And then when those bushels go to the biofuel manufacturer, they are buying the physical bushels, and they are buying the data. The score goes on the scale ticket, as does the verification ID, goes on the scale ticket, And then they can utilize that score as part of their equations as they calculate all of the bushels that go into their annual production and report to the IRS their overall carbon intensity score. So it's our job on the farm and folks at the elevators um, to make sure that we're pooling this data together, pooling these farms together in order to really move the needle here. We need a volume of farmers who are ready to go and participate for most ethanol plants they're going to need at least 20% farmer participation to get below the baseline threshold of a CI score of 50. But the more far, the more farmers we have coming to the table, the lower the CI scores we have coming to the table, and uh, the more data that we've got, the better in avoiding fraud and then capitalizing on this incredible opportunity. So uh, elevators, I would encourage you to start asking your farmers, what is their CI score? Start gathering the data because your ethanol friends are absolutely going to be asking for that data. And farmers, we need to know what our scores are because that's where it all starts. So we are gr- glad you are out in the truck somewhere in Iowa, as we talked about, and really appreciate your insights here and your guidance on how we all can participate in this. Um, we're going to close our next interview uh, visiting closer downstream to the consumer with a discussion from Dr. Paul Bloom. He's the Chief Carbon and Innovation Officer at GIVO. Aviation remains one of the last frontiers to conquer in significantly reducing our global emission footprint for transportation. Aviation emissions have grown 4 to 5% each year over the past decade, but our next guest says this might actually begin to change soon. We're joined today by Dr. Paul Bloom. He's the Chief Carbon Officer at GIVO. So welcome, Paul. Thank you very much, Terry. Appreciate it. 
Now, Paul, you shared some really fascinating updates at the National Ethanol Conference about a month ago on ways that the airline industry is stepping up uh, to the plate to reduce their carbon emission footprint. I'd like you to tell us about GEVO and maybe update us on your own journey to produce sustainable aviation fuels. So we're really excited to, to focus on a hard-to-abate segment of the economy like aviation. And you know the way that we're really doing this at GEVO is um, to build a, a business system that can take carbon abatement seriously from, from the feedstock all the way to the seat on that aircraft. Right. And so how do we do that? Um, at GEVO, we're, we're using crop-based feedstocks um, produced through climate smart uh, agriculture. Right. So that's a, that's a key thing that we have to be able to do. And then we have to couple that with renewable energy. Right. So we have to power the production of sustainable aviation fuel um, in a way that doesn't have any carbon emissions. And when we do that, we combine those two together and we can not only get that carbon abatement down to uh, potentially zero, but by the time that that fuel is produced and actually used, we've removed more carbon equivalents than, than we actually emitted from burning that fuel. Right? That's the real goal of what we're trying to do um, on how we produce the fuel. I love that interaction too with with farmers. We just had Mitch Hora, who was also on the panel with you, and you know these are some lofty goals. The Biden administration has said that they'd like to have three billion gallons of sustainable aviation fuel in the next six years, but going from 37 million gallons today to that three billion is going to take some investment and in infrastructure and technology advancements. Share with us and identify what you see as some of those key building blocks to help set this industry up for success. I think we do need to come to uh, some conclusions around what is the value of carbon abatement today um, when you're buying petroleum-based fuels. There's no extra charge for that carbon abatement. But at the same time, we have companies out doing direct, direct air capture and turning that CO2 then back in power to liquids or something like that. And, you know, we're, we're not really thinking about what's that total cost. And so when we're thinking about this, like we think that we've got the lowest cost of carbon abatement by using coupling climate smart agriculture with a, with a renewable production through alcohol intermediates to get that lowest cost. But is that is that good enough? Will people pay for that? Is that really a good enough um, uh, value proposition? So I think we, we really need to get that piece done. And then I think the other big pillar for us is about um, being able to measure it, right? You got to be able to prove what you've done. And so we created a, a system called Verity, which is a distributed ledger technology to track that carbon all the way from that field, again, to the seat on the aircraft and prove at every step what's actually happening because the customers need to have the trust and the transparency in order to really say like, yes, we believe in it. So I think those are kind of the big things. And then of course we need things like the infrastructure, right? There's been a lot of discussion around pipelines and carbon capture. Uh, obviously we need to have those levers available to help us decarbonize. We need to have more renewable energy, renewable wind and the right policies that actually count all the carbon. Right. So if you're going to do that and that's the way that we can reward uh, everybody in the value chain from the farmer to the renewable energy provider to the to the renewable fuel pr producer. And let's not forget that while we're doing this, right, we're always producing um, protein and, and nutrition products for the food industry. So it's not all about SAF. And, you know, at Jiva, the other thing that we really focus on are things like renewable chemicals. So another hard to abate carbon market segment. So it, it really, if we can get it right, it's really broad reaching and a really big deal. But those are kind of some of the big things that I see. Paul, what a great conclusion to our four-part dialogue here for our Energy and Transitions video podcast. And uh, I want to thank my colleague, uh, Terry Vishwanath, uh, to really dig into a lot of these topics that we're starting to hear more about, and, and we're excited to see where this industry is going forward. <music>